The book is about Joe Paterno, Jay Paterno's new book, Paterno Legacy, Enduring Lessons from Life and Death of My Father, now available in stores. Jay is the uh, son of the former Penn State head coach and uh, former assistant coach at Penn State. He joins us now. Jay, welcome. How are you? Good to be here. Uh, I guess I'm supposed to say six feet, 190. Is that right? Yep. There you go. <laughs> what? I need to be 180, but I'm about 193 <laughs> right now. What is football like at uh, the house on Saturdays now? Well, you know, if Penn State's home, I'm at the stadium. So, that, that you know, so I'm up there and, you know, I'm up in the suites and everybody asks me, what the coaches should be doing, and I tell them, look, I wasn't, I don't want to be that guy because I didn't like those guys saying, you know, things when I was there. But you know, it's uh, it's different, obviously, not being involved. But uh, so it's a different vibe. But you know, I love Penn State football; that'll never change. Why write a book? Uh, certainly now, given that we sort of moved on from Penn State a little bit, does this bring things back up? Will this bring things back up in a negative way? No, I think one of the things that I think it's important for people to understand is this is not a Sandusky scandal book. This is a book about uh, the life of, of, of my father, and I got to see him as a father, as a grandfather, as a guy on his team, as a guy I coached for him. I saw the impact he had on so many people, but obviously I do address that. I, I mean, you can't write that book without addressing it, and I'm not naive to that. But uh, in this book, when, you, when I talk about that, there is a very, very strong defense of Penn State first, and and my dad second, so um, you know it's it's not going to bring up negative things related to Penn State. It's going to it's going to set the record straight on some things that are that are critical. But you're uh, setting the record straight. You're defending Penn State. Are you defending Penn State or defending your father? Both, because uh, I think what people around the country don't do not understand, and, and I understand why. Believe me, I I understand some of the stories that were were out there reflected so negatively on the university when the truth of the matter is um, the vast majority of things that Jerry Sandusky was convicted of and did had nothing to do with Penn State football. They were not on Penn State's campus. They were away from Penn State. And But that, that's not the perception a lot of people have, and I wanted that to be cleared up. And also, uh, as it relates to Penn State's athletic program, uh, you know, these things were reported outside the athletic program uh, and reported outside the university, but that's not what a lot of people think. People think there was this, this grand cover-up, and that's just not true. Last time you saw or spoke to Jerry Sandusky? Uh, I have no idea. It would be certainly before he was arrested. Um, but that said, my daughter uh, and his granddaughter were on the same youth soccer team. So my, my daughter, before he was arrested, you know, was at a birthday party in his house that my wife took him took her to so um it would be it certainly i i couldn't give you the exact date to be to to really pinpoint it do you have any idea about him no absolutely not and, and just like i said i would certainly not have put my daughter at a birthday party in his house um as a parent if i knew that uh certainly would not have done that um no no parent would um so we had no idea i mean i know my my entire life and these types of things are almost impossible to con- to, to even get your head around, let alone somebody you knew, and somebody you knew as a pillar of the community, a you know, a church-going, married, non-drinking man who started a statewide charity to benefit young people. I mean, everything about him was had, was the other way. I mean, it was stunning. I mean, absolutely stunning. What's the most painful part of this, aside from your father actually dying? But the most painful part of this that you saw as you're watching your father. Well, I think you know. My dad was one of those people that, you know, he always tried to do the right thing. You know, he wasn't perfect, and certainly that comes through in the book. I mean, I, I'm not afraid to say he wasn't a perfect dad, and I'm not afraid to say I was far from a perfect son. But, you know, people saying that he was involved in covering something up, which we now know is not true. The evidence all point, it, it backs that up. Um, that he would stand by and protect his, the, the image of his football program over the welfare of children. This is a guy that gave his entire life to helping young people, not just as a coach, but he was involved in the Special Olympics, he was involved in education, he was involved in, in raising money for so many charitable organizations. I mean, everything about his life was completely counter to the misperceptions that some people got out of this, and that was that's painful to deal with. He's Jay Paterno, the son of Joe Paterno. His new book is available. Joining us, Dan Patrick Show. I wondered if it was generational, Jay, of what was described to your father, of him even comprehending that this could possibly happen with Jerry Sandusky and these little boys. Well, I don't think there's any questions generational. I mean, when you really think about it, I mean, my dad said to me, and I relay the story in the book, 
you know, at one point after this all came out, he said, you know, Jay, I just had no idea. He said, you know, if something like this happened in the 1930s in Brooklyn when I was growing up, some people in the men in the neighborhood would have taken the guy out and beaten him to within an, an inch of his life, and we, nobody would have known why, and that would have put an end to it, and no one would ask. So, I mean, there's no question it was generational in and, and, and his background. But that said, you know, I'm 45 years old, and I even remember being warned about – you know, the guy in the van with candy or a puppy yeah. who's cruising the elementary school parking lot or the playground parking lot. You know, the idea of a nice guy offender is something that uh, a lot of people don't understand, even even younger people now. How painful was it to see him take down the statue? Well, I never watched it, and so I didn't see it. And when I drive by it now, I know where it was supposed to be, where it's supposed to be. And, you know, I didn't get caught up in that, that part of it. You know, I just, uh, I'm more concerned that, the accuracy of the story ends up emerging, not just for my dad, but certainly for, for Penn State. And so many people did the right things in this program at this university for so many years. What but, about uh, Obviously, if somebody wants to put it back up, I'm certainly not going to get in their way. <laughs> if I said you could restore the victories or put that statue back up, what would you want done? Victories first, simply because they belong to so many people who did things the right way. Student athletes, professors, alumni, administration, coaches, they belong to so many people beyond my dad, and he'd be the first to tell you that if he was here. Yeah, I, I thought that that was unfair that they took away those those victories from him. The statue, you know, I can I, that didn't affect me as much as the victories because I th- those were earned. You know, you're punishing him uh, individually, and and I look, I get social media. I know that you had to have somebody there. If it wasn't Sandusky, you had Joe Paterno and attach that to it. And everybody had a column or a radio show to do. So I, I understood all of that. I still don't know exactly what went on that the NCAA said, we're going to punish you this, this harshly. What did Penn state actually do wrong in this situation, Jade? want to know the great irony of all this is uh, less than a month ago, the NCA put out guidelines as to how university athletic departments are supposed to handle allegations of sexual uh, assault committed by student athletes or committed by staff members. The guidelines describe 2AT exactly what Joe Paterno and Penn State did. They say report it, don't follow up, don't try and direct an, direct an investigation. You report it outside the athletic department and you let the university and the outside law enforcement handle it, which is exactly what Penn State did. So um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, nobody's explained it. And one of the reasons I think the lawsuits, as, as you know, we've got some very favorable rulings uh, about a week and a half ago that allow us discovery and those kind of things. Nobody from the NCAA has yet to go under oath and say, this is why we did it. Um, so, you know, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun when we get to deposition discovery time to have them finally have to say, what exactly did Penn State football and the Penn State University do wrong to warrant these kind of sanctions? I'm glad they've lifted the ball ban. I'm glad they've restored the scholarships. But um, they're going to come a time where they're going to they're gonna have to sit up and say, we got this wrong all along, and these sanctions well, were now warranted. And, you know, I think it's important they don't – uh, that directors of the NCA don't feel they can operate outside the, the NCA's own rules uh, in the future, too, as well. What do you think your father's legacy is in, in, in town or in Pennsylvania? Well, I think it, the legacy is going to be the people that he impacted, and that's what I hope really comes through in this book is the lessons and the lives that he changed. You know, he, you know coaching football did not define him. It was what he did. It was the medium by which he really created the, the art and the masterpiece of his life, which were the lives he changed for the better and the lives he changed uh, of guys he coached and people uh, that some people that he never met that, that got lessons from the way he conducted himself and handled himself. And I think that is what I hope the legacy is. I think obviously people in Pennsylvania are closer to it uh, and they're more aware of all the issues around the last couple months of his life. And they've, they're more open-minded to it. And I think nationally it's starting to change. The perception is starting to change. Um, but there's people you're never going to get back. That's just the, the truth of the matter, and I understand that. How would he if, he, if he did live and, and he had to deal with these accusations, uh, you know, that, that, that just stayed there, uh, how would he have dealt with that? Well, I think this story is very different if he lived in the, in the regard that, you know, everybody knows when there's any kind of 
uh, scandal and you go and write, write a report, you blame the dead guy uh, because the dead guy can't defend himself. And, you know, the, the, as Free was writing this report, our lawyers were engaged and were willing to turn over documents and said, look, let's, if you have things you're going to allege about Joe, we'd love the, the ability to address them. And he never, never took us up on that and issued the report. And he issued the report in the you know, All-Star break. As you know, there's nothing to report. So that was the only sports story that day, and it just got repeated over and over and over again. So I think if he were alive, it turns it would this thing turns out very differently. And I think when you look at the way Syracuse University handled their situation with Bernie Fine, they stood behind Jim Beheim. They allowed him to go out and address it, and their scenario turned out very very differently, obviously, than Penn State's did. I guess the only thing I'd, I I still have a hard time wrapping my arms around Jay is that Jerry Sandusky did have access to the campus right he did have access he was there at practice or games and even to be in the shower and well that's one of the, that's a misperception that you have right there when you, after jerry retired he was not at practices he was not at games we really didn't see him um, we would see him occasionally he would come in in the morning and work out early in the morning by himself that's the only time i ever saw him um, after the 2001 incident he was told not he could not bring anybody else in the building again and that did not, you know, he did not do that. He but he still people. had access, though. But he had access simply because of the fact that he had not been convicted of a crime and the access he was given. You know, Jerry Sandusky was a tenured professor and faculty member of Penn State. Yeah. And at Penn State, when you retire as a tenured professor or faculty member, you're given an office, you're given access to facilities. So that was a, a retirement agreement that was negotiated by the provost of the university, not the athletic department. They had no over; they could not overrule that. But how do they? How would somebody not know that Jerry Sandusky is there with children or a child? Well, the, the matter, the truth of the matter is, after the 2001 incident, he wasn't there, and there's no reports that he was there with children. After but prior to that, though, Jay, and prior to that, you know, the the, the, the night that he was that Mike McQuarrie saw what he saw. Um, was a Friday night in the off season at a late hour, so we're not there. So we never saw him. We just never saw him in there with kids. Mm. With that said, if you saw him around town with kids, this is a guy that had adopted six children. The state of Pennsylvania judged his home worthy to, you know, for, for him to adopt six kids, yeah. but also placed multiple foster children in his home mm. all the way up until really the time that he was being investigated. So, you know, there was never anything where we thought like it's unusual for him to be around it. Now, if somebody and it's, and it's hard for your mind to even go there to think those things. Um, so that's I mean, I understand why people say, well, how could you not know it, that? That's why, because people with much more experience in these issues, child psychologists at the second mile that were around him with kids didn't see it. Um, the state didn't see it. They were putting foster kids in his home. So, you know, I understand how people say, hey, how could you not know? But there are people a lot better educated and, and, and versed in these issues that didn't see it either. Um, it doesn't mean it, it, you know, it's not painful for the kids that were the victims in this, and I don't mean to, to say that in any way, but the truth of the matter is, you know, so many people miss this. Did Mike McCreary's testimony help or hurt your father? Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know that. Um, you know, Mike told everybody he was intentionally vague with Joe. Um, simply because, again, generationally, these are things you can't talk about. You know, you know, there, there's there's a story in the book where I talk about how he tried to give me the father son talk about sex two days before I got married. I was the first son to get married. And how old were you? I was twenty. What was I? Twenty three ish. Twenty two. Almost twenty three. So he's having the birds and bees conversation with you at twenty three. That's the first one. And <laughs> and and I was le- this two days before I'm getting married, mind you. I'm walking down the steps of the garage. My car is running. And the only reason I ran into him is because I went in to get a soda for the road. I'm driving to Pittsburgh. My dad was driving it the next day. And as you see, he's looking at my car like, oh, my God, he's leaving. He comes in the garage from his lunchtime walk. He's all sweaty. And he walks. He said, hey, I'll see you down tomorrow. As he walks past me, I could tell he's hovering. And I turn around. And he said, hey, um, do you need to talk to me about anything? Do you need me to talk to you about anything? And I didn't know what, the, and then it dawned on me, like, oh, my God, he's going to try and have to talk with me in the garage. <laughs> so I said, that, I said, I'll figure it out. Don't worry. <laughs> and I don't know who was more relieved, him or me, because <laughs> neither one of us really wanted to witness that conversation. But, you know, I had five kids, so obviously I, I found out how it worked. Uh, hey, well done. Uh, Jay, uh, we'll end on that note. Good luck with the book, and we do appreciate you joining us. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it, Dana. And, you know, I got to tell you, 
I have great respect for you, and I have great respect the way that you've handled this over the course of the last couple of years, too. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Jay Paterno, son of uh, Joe Paterno, the uh, new book, Paterno Legacy, Enduring Lessons from the Life and Death of My Father, available in stores now. 